Good evening and welcome to this uh, panel uh, on corporate governance after COVID-19. Um, on behalf of myself and the speakers um, who, uh, who I have the great honor to moderate uh, this evening, um, we look forward to having a lively debate uh, on the evolution of corporate governance um, in these last few months. And I'm afraid uh, we're not quite as the uh, title of the panel promises uh, after COVID-19, but we do certainly think that there are a number of um, very important uh, corporate governance developments that are worth to highlight and discuss um, at this Horizon uh, meeting. Um, and we do, I have participated in the past, just to give you a, um, a little bit of a flavor in previous uh, conversations that were orchestrated by uh, Frank and his brilliant team. And it's a pleasure, it's my first time to do this virtually. Um, and I look forward to, to, uh, to uh, what, um, what promises to be uh, a lively conversation. So perhaps, um, in the interest of time, if I may start with just introducing a couple of uh, points that I think are interesting to discuss uh, this evening um, on, on relevant governance developments. And I think the starting point would be to say that in, in conversations that I've had with thought leaders, with the board members, regulators, um, um, members of the C-suite, um, it seems that there is a dichotomy, if I may say so, between the speed of evolution of the corporate sector or the challenges that the corporate sector is facing worldwide and the speed of evolution of corporate governance rules. So what we've seen so far, at least in my uh, personal um, perception, is that um, we're seeing quite a slow evolution of corporate governance rules and regulations, mostly dealing with the of company filing obligations um, in the transition to the virtual uh, space in the, in the board um, uh, meetings and in the annual shareholder meetings. Uh, yet the space or the speed with which the corporate sector has moved in the last few months in terms of the challenges that they're facing is much more, um, much, much further than um, the, the speed of regulatory change. Um, so what kind of, I, I think um, the relevant question is what kind of uh, pressure points are we seeing in, in the world of corporate governance? I think a couple of things merit to be highlighted. As I mentioned, the transitional to the virtual, um, also the um, the greater or the, the continuing pressure on institutional investors to be much more vocal and active in terms of corporate governance. Um, I don't know, for those of you who follow the space, the uh, BlackRock, which is the largest institutional investor, has issued their stewardship report in which they uh, purport to have engaged with about 17, um, 16,000, sorry, uh, uh, companies where they voted um, against um, um, management recommendations worldwide, uh, and these trends are, are are continuing to unravel. One more point I would like to to make before we we jump into the debate uh, and the questions is is the the perhaps commingling or the entry of political in the world of corporate governance. And I think that it's something that we've never seen before at this um, pace and scale. Um, a couple of examples, of course, we, you know, for those of you who follow the TikTok debate is a, is a primary example of where politics has entered into the world of the corporate in a way that perhaps we've never seen before. Uh, we also see, and we'll be discussing with you further um, this evening, the role of sovereign wealth funds um, uh, in, in as, as active players in acquiring assets worldwide, and also the world of um, the role of governments in, in, in protecting assets and acquiring states stakes in um, both previously state owned and, and private companies, um, and and the various manifestations of of this political um, interference or political involvement in the world of corporate and in the world of governance include. For example, um, the American um, um, the American uh, government uh, uh, requirement or recommendation that their own pension funds don't invest in Chinese companies, and the subsequent uh, announcement by the American uh, by the U.S. stock exchanges that they will be much more careful in allowing foreign issuers, i.e., Chinese issuers, uh, access uh, local capital markets. So, with that. Uh, very broad overview. I would like to introduce our, our fantastic panel here today. We have um, speakers from Europe, from the Middle East, and also from the United States. Um, Abdulaziz Al Suleyti, who's the chairman of Al Suleyti uh, Group, um, from joining us from uh, Qatar. We have Marcia Dyson, who's uh, joining us from the United States. She's the chief executive officer 
of um, and founder of the Women Global Initiative, um, uh, Thomas Gillis, who's a partner in Baker, Baker McKenzie in Germany, who I think is joining anytime now, um, and Stephen uh, Klemenczyk, I hope I got your name right, uh, who's the managing director of Ancora Holdings. So with that, um, I would like to welcome you all to this panel. Um, and perhaps if I may start to with with general question to all of you um, to open this debate um, and to ask you how companies and by that C-suites and board members you think have been put under a new strain in the regions or in the countries where you, you work and you operate and you advise um, in the midst of this COVID pandemic. May I ask, um, perhaps uh, ladies first, uh, may I ask um, <laughs> Marcia to share your views on, on this question? Well. A lot of things that, first of all, thank you for having me and to be part of this esteemed panel. A lot of things that happened in America and around governance, especially corporation that has been uh, propelled by uh, Black Lives Matter. And we can't overlook that in this conversation because even though uh, my interest is in how women are advanced in corporate uh, the corporate world, the business world, it definitely has an impact, has, has an impact on not only into ways into which corporations deal with the situation, but also how they deal with a particular segment of our population. And it's up for debate. It has impacted corporations from Facebook to Amazon, which we'll talk about later. And because I also interact in the banking world and have friends who sit on uh, boards and also individuals who are senior vice presidents of international banking, also understand how that also impacts our policies here in America, and information that often our citizenry does not have. And so what we're looking at today is an opening to American citizens, particularly, and even women and the men in the workplace, to have a conversation that they never had privy to before because we were so isolated. But thanks to social media and the things that are blowing up in the world that impact our economy, which we definitely feel now in the COVID, as we see our economy slowing down, even though we've had some growth in surprisingly other areas, that we are now more awakened to have a broader conversation, which was denied or better yet, not revealed to us for we can, so that we can push certain policies in our country, look more closely at the governance, how the corporations internationally work as American uh, corporations with other countries. And also it gives us voice to dictate more, especially to our congressional members and other representatives in our government, how we want to move as a global economy by the citizens and not just our government alone. Right, and, and um, if I may ask, while I have you on this, on this question of diversity, which we, as we all know, have um, dominated the agenda for a couple of years now, especially from the perspective of board diversity, with a number of initiatives uh, appearing globally and, and country-specific initiatives like the 30% Club and others. What is your perception about the sort of the results that we'll see um, following this uh, Black Lives Matter movement, which has now added a further complexity on, on top of what was originally already complicated debate about how to get women to get on board, um, especially in, in, in the US. And, and do, do you see that um, it will complicate the issue? It will bring greater attention to it? What might be some of the expectations that we can have in that regard? It definitely brought more attention to it. And what we are uh, facing now, what I like to call for people who, who know, uh, you know, my work with Reverend Jackson in the 60s as the chief of staff as international black trade, uh, international trade bureau was to first of all integrate black businesses and to look, uh, the economics of our country here. And you saw later that Reverend Jackson actually went to Silicon Valley because of the absence of black presence, not only on boards, but just in the space itself. And when you come and I look at specifically at women and blacks, African-Americans particularly, we saw the opening of the doors that most corporations had closed or at least not allowed us to have porthole to uh, I have the privilege of working with a very <laughs> high level tech company right now and I'm consulting on diversity and inclusion. But what is ironic about it as they're seeking out what I call black Christmas is that corporations, which is kind of a form of a quasi reparations for African Americans are showering black people <laughs> and businesses with funding. And that's good. But what is not under that sort of called Christmas tree is access to board board membership 
which is where the power lies. It helps dictate how investors feel about it. It gives investors also voice. And when you look at African Americans, particularly, we have given what we call the flavor flavor to the economy of our country, the appropriation of our style, our music, our dress is fell across the board. And so now we are taking advantage of that appreciation. But what we have to realize, as most people in the world know, whether you are in sovereignty or if you're in a democracy or whatever your country is, when it comes to business, you get into the room where it happens if you know someone who is inside the room who has the key to the door. And that has been a problem in America. We have not well, that room. The interesting, of course, development in that regard is the, the California um, bill proposal that, that says, you know, that uh, companies shall, shall um, appoint at least one um, uh, representative of the African-American community. But anyways, we'll come back to that. Perhaps I'll, I'll ask that same question of, um, of, um, of Stephen and then perhaps of Dulaziz. What are your thoughts as how companies have been dealing with this at the board and the C-suite level? What has shifted in in the U.S. and in Qatar, respectively. Perhaps I'll, I'll start with Stephen, if, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, we've seen an effort uh, in, in the companies that we, we speak with. We have seen a, a very conscious effort to, to reach out to the African-American community. Um, it, it's, I, frankly, I think it's with mixed results. Um, there's still the question in my mind of, is it for show or is it serious? Um, and I think it, that, that, that question goes uh, corporation by corporation. Um, some clearly are vested in it and are re- making a real effort and others uh, I'm convinced are doing it because they think they should and for show and they'll find uh, at, at the risk of, 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 of at the risk of being uh, using a rude term, using a token to put in the board. Um, and I, I don't know that that's, well, I'm pretty convinced that for those guys, it's not going to get where they need to go. I mean, diversity is, the black community in the United States is an underserved community. They have an enormous amount of potential and they should be brought forward. Um, however, um, there is still a stigma of uh, the old boy network that has to be overcome. And uh, and it, I still think there's a long road to go for that. And what are some of the other, if I may ask, just to, to follow up question, the other sort of significant challenges that you see boards are, are considering uh, battling with, uh, apart from the kind of the, the composition side, um, in the U.S., in, in companies that you are currently working with, what are the pressure points from a governance perspective? The, the big, the big problem. Well, the, actually, there's several. I mean, it's it's hard to pick just one right now in this current environment. So there are several that that they're dealing with, uh, not the least of which is, you know, where am I going to put my money? Um, you know, there are corporations that that have a significant amount of money in the bank, have a significant access to cash to do something with. There are some board members who are activists and want them to push the money out and invest it. And others, mm-hmm. other boards are going, well, I need to keep me. And this is a really, really tricky environment right now. So I think I'm going to look inward as opposed to look out and I'm going to invest in, uh, you know, cybersecurity and uh, the Internet of Things, uh, processes and changes internal as opposed to uh, looking outside. Um, there, I, IBM, uh, an IBM Institute just did a study not too long ago. Uh, just came out with results. I thought it was very interesting that uh, I, I deal very heavily in the, in the world of foreign investment. So w- what I found interesting was that uh, they did a survey. It was uh, 3,500 executives in 20 countries. And as it worked out, um, the things that would matter to me as a, as a, as a guy that deals in foreign investment is uh, where you are, are you looking at new markets and are you doing product development? Because these are the things that you're either going to push foreign investment or you're going to attract foreign investment. Right. They were both at the very bottom of the list of about a dozen things, and less than only in, only about half of the uh, the executives said we're going to go forward with that, which is a significant oh. drop from previous years where those two items were very high on the list. Now they're at the bottom, and so <laughs> there's clearly a focus inside. There's a follow-up question, if I may ask, because you you were mentioning this very interesting. Um, the economy between in- inward and outward focus. And, and we all know that companies all over the world were basically prior to this crisis and uh, share buyback spree all over the world. Um, and that has obviously stopped in tracks. I mean, the, the, the ECB had told uh, the banks that they have to stop any of these programs and stop dividends and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And there are similar developments in other countries. What are your thoughts about sort of, um, or do you have views on, on this issue of share buybacks and where companies are basically 
you know, stopped in, 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 that, in that tendency? What, what, what might be the implications of that going forward? Um, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I think the company should be, should be able to do what they think they need to do in their best interest. Um, and if I don't think it should be an issue of banks interceding and saying you can't do buybacks, I think they should be allowed to. Um, and and, and it, it, will, it will take the results where they go. Um, I, I tend to, my personal opinion is I tend to l- l- let things happen as they will. And I'm a minimalist as far as, as uh, regulatory interference is concerned. So um, I, I would prefer to see them lay off of that. Okay. So let's um, perhaps with that uh, thought, and we'll come back to it uh, later in the in the conversation, uh, turn our attention to Abdelaziz. Welcome uh, to this uh, conversation. Um, and I would like to ask you, I mean, your region is one that I'm very familiar with. And actually, I think the last uh, live presentation I gave was uh, was uh, uh, nearby uh, in, in, in the Middle East. But um, for now, I'll have to we'll have to content with what we can. Um, it, what is your feeling as to reactions in, in Qatar to this crisis? It's, it's a very different economic, obviously, context uh, that what we currently have in the, in the United States and in Europe, also very different political context. What is your feeling as to how companies are affected by it? And, you know, what, what might be their experience um, from previous crises, notably the GCC sort of um, uh, issues that we've had before, where they might have had learned uh, experiences or skills that are useful in, in facing um, this type of, um, let's say, extraordinary uh, situations? Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you for having me in this panel. I'm uh, delighted to be joined by uh, esteemed panelists as well as uh, hosted by you. Um, and to answer your question, I think we've seen uh, different reactions uh, from different segments in the market. Um, particularly in, in Qatar, there is a unique uh, business uh, environment in which um, there is something that we call the Qatar Financial Center. It's an onshore business um, and financial um, a platform where companies and primarily international companies or companies that are planning to operate in international markets, um, they would incorporate their businesses in QFC. Um, the reason behind that is that it, it, uh, it uses the common English law um, and, and uh, that, that really has much more um, recognition versus using the local um, laws that, that are in Arabic and they require different legal structures that are really not common in international market. So what we've seen is that these regulatory authorities, specifically the Qatar Financial Center, um, really try to streamline um, the legal and regulatory environment and framework, especially after the 2017 uh, blockade uh, and the diplomatic issues with Saudi Arabia, UAE, um, as well as other uh, neighboring countries. Um, so this, the environment already uh, was um, in that trajectory to be more um, resilient to any uh, major disruption. Um, you, they've worked uh, very closely in, in consultation with uh, various companies that are housed within this uh, financial center, um, and especially the CEOs, the chairman, the C-boards, and to understanding exactly what is needed for them to be able to operate during such difficulties. Um, you know, uh, obviously, a particular fear is always about uh, employment, considering that Qatar is really uh, uh, reliant on, on uh, foreign um, expertise and, and uh, workers. Um, so, so we've seen a lot of, uh, you know, one of, one of our, our um, executive level employees couldn't really come to Qatar all the past uh, uh, six six to seven months. I'm sorry, I'm just having Siri for some reason go off. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, and, and so we've had, uh, you know, uh, some, some issues with the employment standards offices, with immigration. So that really prevented a lot of the companies and really um, hurt a lot of the companies. Um, so, so the shock of not being able to have your employees in person really rendered most of our work to be virtual um, in a virtual office, which is unusual for Qatar, um, yes. where you're mandated by regulation to have a physical office where you're supposed to uh, operate within a physical office. Um, and, and so the virtual environment was really unprecedented. Um, and, and so we've seen within just a few weeks that even government offices and government agencies that typically don't really, um, uh, you know, rely on a technology that much, and except, you know, the past few years, we've seen a lot of development in that area. Um, 
so so th there has there was a lot of consultation with all these different entities. Um, they've really mobilized uh, the Qatar Development Bank, the Qatar Financial Center, all these different uh, financial technology hubs um, in order to make sure that whatever the crises uh, at that point, there will be favorable um, regulatory and legal changes to ensure that all these companies are, are still operating and not really losing money. Idrisi, may I follow up with a question that's a little bit perhaps uh, specific because, as, as I mentioned, I do a lot of work uh, in the Middle East. I'm quite familiar with the region. And, and what we've seen recently, and I, um, I suppose you, you would have particular insights on that, is, of course, a number of cases of companies, and I've written on this also quite widely in, in international media, whether it's you know, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg and whatnot. There were a number of um, significant cases that I, I would think or I believe have I've shaken confidence um, in even in the financial zones. So in, in you know the NMC case right now, with, which is an Emirati healthcare company, which is under major restructuring, um, the largest healthcare provider being restructured in the largest healthcare crisis. I mean, I think we can all see the irony in that. Uh, there was the Abraj case, uh, which is in, in some ways still unraveling, a private equity firm that uh, essentially. Um, um, where all kinds of fraud were was discovered, I think that <laughs> in the auditors and in the banks and um, all kinds of relationships. And and I wonder, from your perspective, did is this throwing another shade around the region and, and sort of trust that investors abroad um, have in in some of the region's companies? Because let's face it, I'm not sure that outside investors actually have enough knowledge or, or a subtlety to recognize the differences between the Qatari regime, the Emirati regime, uh, and other regimes in, in this region. Is this something that you think has, has consequences for, for region's companies? Um, it, it most certainly has um, you know, consequences and implications, I think, in transparency among uh, um, those companies and, and uh, the institutions. Um, is really important, and it has increased, uh, especially over the past few months. Uh, um, it really allowed for companies and for these institutions to share the best practices and ideas on, on how to be effective, on how to counter any uh, of these issues. Um, I, I think when it comes particularly um, to, to trust issues, um, obviously there, there's always going to be some uh, credibility issues when there's major cases. Um, surrounding the, the financial sector in this uh, in this region, um, and, and so I think it's just a matter of of time, as well as regulatory uh, actions that need to be put in place uh, to really um, regain the trust of these investors. Um, uh, you know, we don't really see a lot of uh, FDI coming into Qatar. Um, we, we see a lot of it go out, and and so that particularly uh, doesn't really put Qatar at a disadvantage. Um, in fact, you know, over the past, um, I, I believe, nine months, um, or to be more specific, uh, 11 months, uh, for example, the Qatar Financial Center, despite the pandemic and in the middle of the, the pandemic, um, the, the employees within the QFC umbrella uh, jumped from some 3,500 to 4,700. So even during the pandemic, there was growth in, in the QFC sector. Um, the, the number of companies uh, increased by by about 100 companies that were incorporated during that period as well. Um, and, and even the, the assets under management uh, increased in that period. Um, so, so we've seen that there, there have been certain um, you know, regulatory efforts within the Qatar Financial Center that really ensured that they have weathered the storm, um, that they're in a better position. And they have right now about 3,000 employees just waiting for the immigration services to reopen next month. So as soon as that happened, you know, the, the number of, of all the employees that are within the KFC will jump dramatically. Um, so I think they've, um, in, in context of Qatar, they, they've really uh, put uh, some good policies. They've really uh, took the wiser steps and set up some impulsive uh, decisions about throwing stimulus left and right. And rather, it was more of a, 
well studied uh, actions approach. It's a, it's interesting because the, uh, some of the points uh, actually that you're you're making um, lead us well into this um, second sort of maybe round of questions that I would like to to explore with you, and that is on the changing shape of the global economy. One of the undeniable parameters that we're seeing basically unfold worldwide is greater government interventionism in, in the in the private sphere. So with the last crisis, of course, we've seen already governments uh, taking stakes in a number of financial institutions with the view to rescue them. I think, uh, and this is again another topic on which myself and, and you know the, the, the center that I run has been quite vocal about and writing quite actively on, is, is um, this growing state participation in the economy. And Qatar and the other Gulf countries, it's always been quite high because of the nature of the economy, the, the fact that there is a, uh, a huge, relative to the size of the economy, uh, sovereign fund and a number of large state owned enterprises and petroleum and other sectors. It is not the case necessarily in, in European countries or US or Canada historically. Uh, and yet what we're seeing now is growth of, of um, uh, government investment and with it, uh, even countries that were, let's say, generally quite liberal, like Japan, in, in terms of their um, investment policies, introduction of additional rules uh, for, for uh, governing foreign uh, acquisitions of local companies, even listed companies, where if you want to acquire a stake, I think above 5% in any listed company, you have to notify a ministry now and get an approval. So quite a number of governments are, are going in that direction, whether it's Japan, Spain, Italy, many others. Um, and I think it also sets um, an interesting trend that I would like to, to perhaps explore with you today. And, and um, if I might turn with that perhaps to, to, um, to Stephen on your thoughts um, as to how this government interventionism might be reshaping rules of the game um, of, uh, in terms of um, the governance uh, field, uh, are we going to see, in your view, uh, more government um, representation on boards? How is that going to play out in terms of competition? And what kind of dynamics, because I know ultimately your your work is heavily centered in the U.S., what kind of dynamics are you seeing in the, in the U.S. in terms of uh, protectionism and the whole CFIUS um, environment that, uh, that governs um, FDI into strategic companies in the U.S.? Uh, well, first off, w with the with the passage of, of, of FIRMA, the Foreign Investment uh, Risk Review Modernization Act. It updated CFIUS and it added new powers. Uh, it broadened the scope. Um, so there was growth before the pandemic in in how much the government was paying attention to uh, foreign investment coming into the U.S. Um, that is that that process has actually been leveraged, I think, to influence a number of foreign countries to do similar uh, because they're you know this is where geopolitics gets involved in the world economy. Um, and so, you know, if, if, if this is good enough for, for me, um, then you should do the same. Um, whether you agree with that process or not, that's a, that's a common thought process in here. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we have firma in place in the United States. So the, what that has done is, is broaden the scope of, of the government's ability to stick its nose into deals and to see are there national security interests at stake? Keep in mind, you know, you hear TikTok is a classic example. You mentioned it earlier. Um, and that's, you know, that's a look back. That wasn't, that transaction never went through an initial security review. So the government has the authority to go back and look at these deals and go, uh, you need to file, we need to take you under review. Was that purely for uh, national security reasons? Was it a political posturing gesture? Was it a little bit of both? I mean, you know, there's only one person that can answer that question. Um, and unfortunately, well, actually, probably fortunately, he's not on the panel. Um, the, <laughs> um, but, but the, the, the another one yesterday. <laughs> yeah, yeah he, he's probably tired from the other one he was just in. Uh, um, so, but 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 the, the the bigger point here is that the, the government's ability, to, the government's always had this ability to do this. Um, now it's more codified. Um, so right. the, the rules and the regulations are being actually put in place and they're not going to change anytime soon. It's not like they're going to get rolled back. Um, it took 10 years to get from, from the previous regulation, which is called, uh, FINSA to today's pharma. Um, and in about every 10 years, there's kind of a, a little bit of an overhaul of the foreign investment regulations coming in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. so that's not going to change anytime soon. Um, what's happened though, is because there are, Geopolitically common, what are considered common threats, there are other countries who are trying to put in similar or p 
parallel processes that are they're trying to leverage. I'm doing this, uh, so uh, pick a country. Um, Australia and the UK, for instance, have been. It, there's a white list for it where they've already since they have parallel processes or they're working on parallel processes that the government is much more comfortable with companies coming from there into the U.S. than say China. Um, mm-hmm. And so China has its own national security review process. Um, it, it came about after CFIUS. It's often considered to be modeled around CFIUS. But so there's a lot of a lot of moving parts in here. But the the, the bigger points I think are, are, are what's what's it going to mean uh, with respect to foreign investment overall? Is it going to slow it down? Uh, the pandemic's taking care of that. Uh, the pandemic is slowing down. <laughs> um, Further. The, you know, it, it, it's not a it's not a function of of, of countries going. Nah, no, nah, I don't think I want to invest. In except with the exception of the Chinese. China said, "No, oh, okay, we're 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 getting beat up quite a bit here, so we're not going to invest as heavily." That's fine. But other companies, companies and countries are actually filling in the void. So while the numbers are down, the numbers are recoverable. Mm. Um, so the CFS procedure. I mean, unfortunately, we we won't have time to go. No, that's fine. Into it, it's it's extremely complicated uh, and, and uh, um, regulation. But I would like to, to maybe ask uh, Marcy, since you're also in the United States and you kind of observe it from uh, from a perspective of you know uh, a citizen and sort of living these events, are you concerned about this encroachment of the political in the various ways that I've described, both in terms of you know governments taking uh, stakes in companies, but also in the kind of politicization of debates, economic debates now with the the war um, or the economic war or tensions between the U.S. and China, and how that's actually realistically impacting corporates in the U.S. who you know might have issues accessing suppliers and in, in, in based in China who might have issues with you know dealing with uh, cross border issues. Is that something that you see as a um, uh, as a as a long term threat, is it something that might get resolved um, in the in the outcome of the of the, of the elections or, or or not? I think it's, I think it's a definitely part of the conversation uh, with our you know that during our presidential campaigning right now. Well, the first thing that I know that was impacted by our foreign relationships is more first disaster relief with COVID the supplies that we get from China around just the safety that. Um, whether it's the mask, you know, most people didn't think about the global impact until we tried to get suppliers from China to get the necessary safety measures that we needed for American citizens around our health care, which was kind of ironic. I don't want to get into our politics on you pointed somebody, then you asked that person to be supplier of your safety. But since I work on an international level with a corporation called the Coalition of Hope, which is active and retired military, we need it in bulks of millions and we don't produce it on, uh, like millions. So it really did inform me on how this particular crisis impacts our global uh, needs and made us look more closely at the politics. People who were not considering it at first had to look at it for that instance alone. And then when we look at American government as it relates to interacting with our businesses here, we see that at many times in the slowing down of the economy, because we do fail bank bailouts, right? Uh, and we also have to say right now during COVID, uh, but the travel industry has definitely impacted the economy when you look at the number of American citizens around hotels and definitely the airlines that our government has built out the airline industry. So it's not something quite foreign to us, but what something has happened for American citizens, we remember that in America, unlike you know maybe smaller countries or people, we have never been so engaged in politics. You know, we're the popularizing of our culture more so than understanding the global picture or the national picture of what rules and directs our daily lives. But say, for example, let me go back to the African-American community and other small businesses. The, com- the government has basically bailed us out in a big time with the amount of monies that have been afforded to banks to allow small businesses to still at least stay open or to thrive during this downturn of our industry. So as we become more aware of that, then it also goes back to the question, okay, who will dictate in those corporations that we actually get that? I think that you mentioned, uh, Steve, about is it just the tokenism that we're finding out in America for as American citizens as far as these minor, uh, I would consider minor economic bailouts, right? In some ways, is yes, that's why I said it's kind of like a black Christmas 
uh, for everybody because we have that opportunity to uh, to be engaged. And and as an impact of women, we want to talk about who is on the board of these uh, corporations that are impacting the conversations in their relationship directly to governing bodies uh, within America, and it's mostly white men. So we have to look at how uh, the people who are diverse in our country have input into those board members, uh, the board seats that are there that fuel the conversation, how they interact with governing bodies outside of corporations. Thank you. Thank you for, for your thoughts on that. But I, I would like to stay on this idea um, of, of, or this explore a little bit further this, this concept of um, um, government interventions and, and sort of the role that uh, that will have on the global economy and, and, and on governance in particular. Um, and ask, uh, this perhaps your thoughts, because you're looking at it from a slightly different point of view. You're not, uh, as you pointed out in your earlier comments, so much a recipient of FDI. Uh, as uh, as a country, as a, as a um, as an active investor uh, through the sovereign fund in a number of uh, sectors, uh, and sovereign funds in the Middle East in general are quite active these days. Understandably so, because valuations are low, and there are uh, tremendous opportunities in Europe and uh, in the U.S. And, and in other emerging markets to to, to you know take whether it's uh, small or consequential um, um, stakes. How do you think this new world is, is going to look like from, from a point of view of, from a Qatari perspective? Is, there, is, is, is Qatar willing or interested, uh, are our countries uh, um, similar to yours, interested to be at the table, at the board table, uh, in, in, in companies that are sort of uh, foreign companies and have their voice heard on critical governance issues? Or do you think it's going to be more of the same that I think we've seen in the past, just more, let's say, passive participations, uh, which didn't lead to, uh, let's say, great amount of investment stewardship so far. Absolutely. I, I think it's, um, you know, uh, noteworthy to go back a little bit, a couple of years, perhaps. And, you know, especially if we're looking at 2018, it, it was a difficult year for many, the geopolitical, macroeconomic uh, uncertainty. Um, uh, that had started some years before only got worse at that point, uh, especially the topics of, as mentioned earlier, the U.S.-China trade tensions and obviously of Brexit. Um, it, it took over most of the agendas of, of a lot of the sovereign wealth funds um, and investors around the world. The major issue wasn't as much as political as it was financial as well. Um, you know, 2018 was the worst um, uh, year for stocks in 10 years. Um, in the United States, you know, the Dow uh, Jones Industrial Average fell by about 5.5%. Um, and, and so just to make it worse, you know, there, there were uh, a drop in equities and, you know, the, the, we didn't see a rise in bonds. Uh, in general, there was a lot of fears. Um, there was a lot of fear um, in, um, especially with the sovereign uh, wealth funds uh, intervening in different markets and then investing large sums of, of money uh, particularly because they're large and they purchase assets in foreign jurisdiction. Um, and from time to time, they really generate controversy because uh, sometimes it's not really out of a pure financial pursuit that they invest in certain um, uh, uh, sectors. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes out of uh, pursuit of some geopolitical objectives. Um, and, and so obviously the case of China being, being one of the, uh, I think, the major cases right now that we're seeing, especially and particularly with the United States, is that, um, you know, with... In response to these controversies in the past, actually, um, I believe about 10 or more years ago, um, the IMF, along with the U.S. Treasury, actually um, sat down about the Santiago Principles. Um, and and uh, the Santiago Principles were, were created and designed for these similar situations to, to really ensure that the investors are there for, financials re for financial reasons and not for some political um, you know, score, not there for um, some, some deals that we don't really understand. Um, so obviously transparency had changed. And I think that overall, we're going to see a lot of uh, um, changes in the governance, robust changes in, in the governance of the sovereign wealth funds. In the past, it was 
a lot of questions about, okay, well, we like these trophy assets. Let's get, you know, uh, for example, if we're talking about the Qatar Investment Authority, we're going to say, let's get some London uh, real estate stakes. Um, let's get the Plaza Hotel in New York City uh, and, and so on and so on. But then there was a change right now that, okay, well, maybe we should be investing more into the transformation of our economy moving 10 years from now uh, to meet our national development plan to ensure that uh, we're, we're changing our economy into uh, and adapting with the fourth technological revolution as well. So I think there, um, across the board, we're going to see um, some changes in, in the governance. Um, so it would be really interesting to see how uh, that really pans out. It's uh, uh, maybe not too early, but it's also still in that uncertainty uh, kind of twilight zone uh, that we hope that very soon we can we can see some uh, uh, changes in these um, uh, governance boards. Uh, Alyssa, if I could very quickly, um, the it's interesting. You made a comment that, that fed into his his discussion about the you know valuations are low, so it's attracting investors and uh, you know the low hanging fruit that the com companies are struggling. They need money. That and that's a product of the of, of COVID. That fact is actually driving a lot of the government intervention because they're setting up to, they're setting up structures and and, and they're and they're tightening the uh, the foreign investment review processes and regimes. And that's not just in the United States, but that's in a number of places around the world to protect uh, to protect companies and industries that are that are struggling, but they don't want to lose control of them. Absolutely. And um, we have only, you know, but less than three minutes to finish, but I'll just say, uh, using uh, my moderator uh, <laughs> prerogative, that, that I think that it's interesting and, and it's something to my mind to explore further. And again, this is something we're writing quite a bit, what the government's actually protecting the right assets, because what they're doing is what they have always been doing is protecting the crown jewels. You know, we have airlines, we have other companies that we need to inject in to keep them afloat. Uh, we have Alitalia, we have Air France, et cetera, et cetera. But is that the right knee-jerk knee reaction? Is it that they should be more uh, active in protecting tech companies that could become the next Apple or the next Google? Is it that they should be looking at agriculture and saying, you know, as Qatar has uh, a couple of years ago, are we sustainable on our own? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when, when the dairy ran out on the shelves, and, and that, that's an interesting story in and of itself, uh, there, there was a solution that was found. And I think there, there are some real life interesting examples and questions to be asked around on that. Around that. But we have about, um, according to my clock, one minute and 39 seconds to be exact to finish this panel. So I would like to perhaps, you know, just give um, a few um, a few words to each one of you to kind of end um, on your thoughts as to what might be the, the kind of the major governance um um, challenges to look out for in, in the next um, year until the next uh, horizons, hopefully less extraordinary meeting. <laughs> so, uh, Marta, I'll start with you and Steve and, and Blasis, please. Okay. Uh, we talk about, people know that the world is, is impacted by the butterfly effect, that is, when the wings water, you know, somewhere, then a hurricane can happen somewhere else. And that's really true. And it really, it took my relationship with culture when it came into acute crisis, I mean, a GCC crisis, to see how that impact that region, and now we find ourselves, because of COVID, feeling the same thing. It made people more aware of what was happening, uh, and that's the same thing in America. And I think that we're becoming more globally conscious, and that for American citizens, where we have the vote and we have access to our governance, that that can impact the global economy and our regulations here in America the same way the Black Lives Matter has done it politically in this day and age. Okay. Steve? Uh, sure. Uh, very quickly, um, in, in the world of uh, foreign investment we talked about and the different re re review regimes that are around the world, um, it is absolutely imperative that boards understand what they're doing and where they're going and what the ramifications are and what the rules are of the country that they're going into. Because frankly, the rules of your home country don't matter. Uh, it matters where you're putting the money is where the rules matter. And they have to understand the rules and have to be prepared to adapt to those uh, and, and recognize that uh, you're going into the other guy's playing field. So you got to play by his rules, um, whether you like them or not. Or if you don't, then don't come. Um, and then the, the trust issue is is, is very real. Um, 
you know, as much as we we mentioned earlier that you know companies you know, want to get want to earn the trust of 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 the governments, the governments themselves want to be able to trust the companies. And in in national security reviews, it is all about trust. Um, if the government doesn't trust you, you're not going to get your deal through. Abdulaziz, any last uh, uh, words to share? Absolutely. I think you know I echo what uh, Stephen has said is that you know we we have to engage the private sector in any restructuring and any diversification plans, and having buy-ins from the government are just as necessary as engaging the private sector. Okay. Well, I think that with that, unfortunately, it's a too too short of a panel. Uh, Forty five minutes is not uh, enough to get into all the issues that uh, we're hoping to to explore. Um, we're available, obviously, for any questions after this uh, after the session. And um, for my part, I just realized I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning of the panel. Uh, you can, you can uh, access a lot of the the governance research that the think that the firm. That I um, that I'm the managing director of produces, which is Govern Center on our website, and also um, through an initiative that, for those of you who are interested in governance, might be might be um, uh, interested to learn or more, learn more of, uh, which is an online uh, TV program called Governance Dialogues, and it's available on on our dedicated YouTube YouTube channel that I host. So a lot of these kind of uh, hard hitting dialogues about where corporate governance is going. Um, post COVID twenty, uh, post COVID nineteen, uh, are available there, and I would like to thank uh, our wonderful panelists for their um, uh, inputs and their diverse views. Uh, and with that, close uh, our virtual panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.